<laughs> Praise the Lord. We have a blip that keeps popping up on the video on the camera itself. So I don't know if it means the camera is going out or if we're experiencing technical difficulties. But it seems to be running. So just like our normal routine, we're just going for it and we'll continue to go on. And we'll try to repair it afterwards as we see that sometimes these things will work and solve as we gradually go through them day to day. But if you happen to notice that kind of irregularities, and that's the problem that's going on, is that the camera, such as it is, <laughs> is the best that we got. So we've been looking in Colossians at Paul's writing to those who were at Colossae or into the church that's assembled there. And we were interested to find that he wasn't writing just to those that were necessarily in the city, but to the faithful brethren and to the saints that were collected there. That there could have been those that were in the city that were maybe like in home Bible studies, if we we're going to make ourselves Colossians and look at ourselves as the Word of God being written to us. That there were some people there that were faithful, that were going to church, and maybe some of the brethren that were not going to church. There were people that were stuck at home or people that were far from the ability to go to a church. So they had to go to the internet or they had to podcast or rebroadcast or in some way learn the best that they knew how. Oftentimes what we do in our modern Christianity is we take for granted as though you got to go to the church every week. Well, it wasn't always so necessarily in those days that the early church began. There was a lot of things happening in the world that people didn't always automatically go to church first. Sometimes they learned as they grew. They would get one letter. I mean, it wasn't as though they had the entire Bible even, you know, to study. But the difference between what they did in those days as opposed to what we do in our days is that they would consider these things. They would talk about them. They would ponder them, rehearse them in their mind. They would speak to each other about them. They would argue about it. They would debate it. They would discuss it. They would have, as it were, those kinds of conversations that would cause them to grow in their relationship with the Lord. And that's what we call prayer, is having a conversation with the Lord. But most people don't quite discuss things with God. And we're, lurking, we're looking at Colossians in the way of examining it for ourselves to say, what is God speaking today to me? What does God want me to hear? How am I supposed to take from this something that's profitable, meaningful, and spiritual for my life that I may go forward and experience a better way that Jesus has promised, a more abundant way that God has said, a more excellent way, as Paul has written, so that we would live our days out in these latter days as a witness to Jesus, as a testimony to the Word of God, as a, an example of a believer and how we should be living, knowing that Jesus is coming in our generation, that we shall see the soon return of Jesus Christ to this world, and some to be raptured and some to be left behind. So, in looking at this, we've gone through Colossians chapter 1, and we've gone into, and we're getting ready to go into chapter 2, but as I prayed about it and I looked, I considered well these words, that were in here that I wanted to re-look at and re-examine and maybe think about these things. So Father, I pray that today, as you've led me in a way that doesn't seem to be in order, you'll put it in order in our minds. That you'll cause us to be rehearsing, as it were, and discussing things we may have overlooked so that we don't underplay any part of the scripture, but we make it real today that, God, you would give us your word by your will and your way, which is by the Spirit of God inciting us, exciting us, and giving us insight into that portion of Scripture that we're going to look at and examine for ourselves so that we can know what you want for us, so that we can grow in the way that you want us to be. Because God, if we just went our own way, we would be our own gods. And the Scripture teaches that we would be like those that die like men, even though we considered ourselves as gods. And we do act that way as being as though Colossians in doing our own thing and choosing our own will and acting like we can be free from any authority. 
And yet, God, we want to submit ourselves to yours. So today I pray that in each and every one of us, God, we might learn to yield ourselves to you. We might bow the knee. We might use our tongue to confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father, but that we might do more than just confess, but that by our life and actions we might profess what it means to be a believer, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what it means to be one of the faithful men and brethren and saints that were at Colossae. So God, show us, lead us, and guide us now in your word. Amen. And so I was looking in the word, and I thought about this, and I kept looking at it, and it seemed like, wow. You know, one of the things that I considered was in verse 19 was that I was just blessed by this. I mean, what a testimony to think about this. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. It pleased the Father. You know, I want to please the Father. I don't know about you, but I want to be pleasing, not just in God's sight, but I want to please the Father. I want to make my Father in heaven happy. I want somehow, some way to find a way in my life today to make the Father of Jesus, to make God our Father happy with me. I want to not just make him happy with me, I want him to be happy, period. Because you see, when God's wrath is poured out, he's not going to be so happy. He stores it up, we're told. How he does that, we don't know. But he stores it, or you could say compartmentalizes it, as we teach in modern psychology. But in the way that he does it, we don't know. Because it says his thoughts are not our thoughts, neither his ways our ways. Neither shall we understand them, nor can we comprehend them. But if there's any kind of similarity with what we call compartmentalization, where we can set aside our emotions for a moment to deal with some other situation and then come back to the emotion and deal with it, then in that way is what the bowls of wrath are like when God pours out his wrath upon the earth. But I want to think about his joy. I want to think about his peace. I want to think about God as love. Because I want him to be pleased with me. I want to also turn his pleasure in me to my actions, my words, my thoughts, my deeds, my life to please him. Because we're told that Jesus pleased the Father. And now we're told here in Colossians something very interesting. It pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. So I like the idea of God wants to give us a fullness that we have not yet entered into. That we could come to some conclusion that we need to look at the word and find ourselves not full or overflowing, but that we can discover and uncover what it is we need to do or we need to ask or we need to live according to what God is saying. So I want to look at particularly verse 21, 22, and 23. And it says in verse, well, let's just go from where it pleased the Father. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in heaven or things in earth. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind, by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. In the body of his flesh, through the death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under the heavens, wherefore I, Paul, am made a minister. And then he goes on to say, how we now rejoice my sufferings, and on and on. But my point is this. You being sometimes alienated, as it says in verse 21, and we talked about the warning that's in verse 23 last week, and we discussed that a little bit, but I have an interesting thing that I want to call this guilt. You know, Do you feel guilty at times? Do you feel like there's something wrong in your mind? Do you have a guilty conscience? Because, frankly, your conscience is programmable. You have the ability to change your mind. You have the ability to reformat your mind. You can be treating your, um, I started to say physical, but I wanted a different word for that. You can treat your mind as a hard drive processor, you know, a computer as it were, that's able to be used in the physiology of the world 
in the physiology, physiology, yeah, physiology, yeah, that works. In the physiological way, your mind can become a computer that you can reformat it and have God rewrite the code so that it becomes the mind of Christ. You see, we're told to put on the mind of Christ. And if we put on the mind of Christ, then we start thinking like he thinks. We start acting like he thought, acts. We start doing like he does. But it says here in verse 21, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Whoa! Enemies in your mind. Are you dealing with situations in your mind that are causing you frustration? In relationships. Do you have a uneven relationship with God in some way that you have unconfessed sin or you have some kind of situation where you haven't given Him your life? Or you're not willing to let go of part of your life where you really, you know, want to hang on to your football games or your Harley or, you know, some carnal fleshy thing that God has said, uh, it's time to give it up. It's time to put away the childish things. When I was a child, I spoke as a child and reasoned as a child would. But when I grew to be a man, I put away childish things. It's time to act like a man. It's time to set aside the world and its ways. The end of the world is coming. I'm going to reward you. It's time to get on with it. Because if you have all these distractions, then the attraction of the world is going to pull you away. And in your mind, you already know that. You know in your heart, when you're thinking about these things, you're going, yeah, you know, I know I'm saved, but... Am I saved enough to be in the rapture, or am I saved enough to go into the tribulation and that I'm going to have to, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of my testimony, and loving not my life even unto death, am I going to be a witness for Jesus that way? Because some will be taken, and some will be left behind. You are not given an assurance that you will be taken. There is no promise of God that says, you get the rapture. As a matter of fact, it's only one in seven churches that really any kind of promise was made that included the church and that included some that were in the church. That's pretty interesting perspective. But then again, we also know that of that one in seven, some people say like Catholic Church isn't Christian. Well, Catholic Church is Christian. Of course it is. It doesn't mean that everybody in it is saved. It just means that it's a Christian church. So... We know by the letters of the seven churches that the Catholic Church is listed in one of those and it says it will go into great tribulation. It will be gone into. And there will be those that need to overcome. And they're pretty much trained to do that. They have a whole teaching of purgatory that's got them ready for the great tribulation. Purgatory and great tribulation, hey, if that's the way you want to live, you know, God bless you and God keep you. But you know what? I don't want to go there. I would rather find myself in that scripture we read to begin with that was up above that in verse 19. For it pleased the Father. What pleases the Father is to be able to stand before Him without a guilty conscience. What pleases the Father is to be able to accept the free gift of grace He's given us. What pleases the Father is for us to be able to come to Him with open arms like a little child and say, Daddy, I love you. God, I want to do what you're doing. I want to see what you're seeing. I want to do it your way, not my way. You see, a man that looks at his son as it grows up, as the baby grows up into being a child, is proud of that child as that child accomplishes things. But if that child is still sucking his thumb and wandering around with fingers in his ears and covering his eyes and saying, I can't see, I can't hear, and I can't talk, and I can't walk, that's not a child. That's a baby. And unfortunately, God wants you to grow up because otherwise you're not going to go up. You're going to go into tribulation. And I would rather find myself personally pleasing God now than finding out my life pleased God and my sacrifice that I offered up of my life in the tribulation period. We're told that I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of our God, that you present yourselves a willing sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But there's also a dead sacrifice. And that dead sacrifice will be you if you go into the Great Tribulation. You're not going to survive. I'm sorry. The odds are way against you. You don't want to know what the odds are. It's been computed out. There's probability factors and there's you know viable mathematical equations that's going to show you that 
you don't want to be there. <laughs> Matter of fact, Paul said, pray to be counted worthy to be spared of those times. Jesus said, woe unto those that even had babies in those times. How bad it will be for them. I don't want to be there. I don't want to warn mothers, hey, you know what? I know you had a baby, but uh, have you considered the consequences of, you know, like you're living in the last days? You probably are going to see your child die. Or somebody's going to steal your child or torture it or use it against you if you're in the Great Tribulation. Can you handle that? I mean, it happened in Jesus' day. So don't think that that's, you know, only some made up thing. In the time of Jesus, Jesus' birthday is not celebrated because, quite frankly, Herod went out of his way to kill all the children that were born at the time of Jesus. And the Romans followed up with that so that as they went and collected their taxes and men were registered, you find out if Jesus would have been, you know, like kind of, uh, they put two and two together, guess what? According to Roman law, he'd still be killed because the edict of the king as it was of the Medes and the Persians, last forever. So, more or less, you know, but during that time, since he was still in charge and his family was still in charge, it would have been enforced. So, what we find is that we should be pleasing God rather than pleasing men. We should look and see if in our mind we have other things that are occupying that space up here in our programming that we put so much into it that we don't know what to do with it, so we've no longer got space for God to occupy our conscience, to give us a good and clear conscience before God, and a clear and good conscience before man. Now, I'll admit, I'm a debtor to every man. I, I bluntly, I owe everybody. You know, there's people that have helped me along the way, and I said, I'll pay you back. I didn't. I couldn't. <laughs> it didn't happen. And I feel guilty to this day. Guilty in a way that I've turned it over to the Lord and God has, ref God has not refused my debt, but has redeemed my debt unto himself, saying, He will repay. And he paid my debt in full. He has taken care of my guiltiness, of my debtedness and indebtedness to others that have helped me along my way. And there have been those that in society have helped me, whether it be the government or a medical situation or circumstances that, yeah, you know, I mean, on one hand, you know, it's like, well, no, it wasn't just of what they've done. But on the other hand, it was like, well, yeah, but I'm responsible. So do I worry about a reputation of my situation if I'm not health care provided? If I don't have medical coverage? I got Jesus, buddy. I mean, what do I need health care for? I mean, no offense. I mean, if it comes along with benefits, great. Praise the Lord. I'll take the benefits. But I would rather have my coverage of the Jesus I know than the man I don't know. Because people seem to think that they're going to live forever and so they invest in all this insurance thinking that they're going to live for the next day and the next day. When in reality, Jesus said, you don't know that you'll live through tomorrow, much less through the end of the day today. So how can you plan tomorrow? You should say, if the Lord wills. And that's why God has to direct our every action. Every circumstance and situation that caused Jesus to have this reputation with the Father was one that he went to his Father and said, what are you doing today? And God said, this is what we're doing. And God looked down on Jesus at the end of his life before he died and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He said, this is the one who has done what I said. This is the perfect representative of me. If you have seen my Son, you have seen me if I could reverse that wording that Jesus said. So, I want to be pleasing. I want to have that reputation. I want to have in my mind a clear conscience. Don't you? How can you? Well, you can by thinking of this. What did it take for you to be saved? How did God provide for you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. In other words, the point of it is God has reconciled it. God has taken care of it. You can't. Your guilty conscience is always going to beat you up until you renew your mind. You begin to appreciate what grace really is and how much God paid the price for your conscience and your wicked works. Because that's something you have to recognize about yourself. You're wicked. And if you're left alone, you'll be wicked.
And if you don't have God inside you, you will continue in wickedness because that's the corruption that's in you. You will corrupt things by your very nature. But if you have the Spirit of God in you and you have the life of Jesus living inside of you, then by very virtue of the Holy Spirit being the light of the world, by virtue of Jesus saying, I am the light and men love darkness more than they love the light, lest they should come to the light and their deeds be exposed for what they are, then God will show you what kind of works you have. And He will remove from you that guilty conscience and He will show you a good conscience before man by saying, admit the truth. For I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth shall set you free. You admit that you are guilty of whatever it may be. And God will set you free because he says, Yes, you're guilty and I paid for it. I paid the price of your guiltiness before God. And I have paid the price of your guiltiness or your guilt conscience before man. So when Satan comes along and gives you that kind of guilty conscience, when you feel like, oh no, you know, I'm so bad, you know, I'm so evil, I'm so wicked, I've done these massive things, it's true, you did. You're guilty. There's no doubt about it. Praise the Lord. You are that person who did those wicked works. But God has reconciled that. God has taken that account and put on the other side the Son of Man's account and said, okay. Here's his spreadsheet, and here's your spreadsheet, and guess what? We're going to balance the books. Oh no, you owe him. He doesn't owe you. You see, God is a debtor to no man, but every man is a debtor to God for what he has done because he has reconciled to himself sinful man. You has he reconciled to himself. As a matter of fact, in Scripture says that Jesus has reconciled all things to himself. So you're reconciled not only to God the Father by way of Jesus doing it, but now you're reconciled to Jesus himself. Even as it says right there in scripture verse 20 where it says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By the blood of the cross he reconciled everything to himself so that he could make peace and that's the reality of why he's called the Prince of Peace. Jesus can give you peace of mind. Jesus can give you, because of what he's done, freedom from this guilty conscience. Jesus can change your mind. Jesus can remove from you any of that with which you thought being an enemy in your mind that would remove you from the intimacy with God and remind you because of how he reconciled you, that you have peace with God. And that's the biggest thing that you have to remember. You don't have, and you aren't an enemy of God, you have peace with God because of Jesus. He is called the Prince of Peace. He was sent to bring peace into the world. That's why we're told that the gospel, when it came forth, was glad tidings of great joy, which shall be for peace to all men, God's will toward men. And he would create peace by dying on the cross to reconcile sinful man with the holy God. And having done that, we now learn and grow in that knowledge by identifying those areas of our wickedness and saying, yes, I did, but God paid for me. Yes, I am sinful, but God paid for me. Yes, I did do that, but God took care of that. And God is going to continue doing that until the day you die. God is going to continually provide for your reconciliation until the very last gasp of breath that you have. But God doesn't want you to suffer and be reconciled. God doesn't want to have to beat you down and be reconciled. God doesn't want to have to drive you into the ground and be reconciled. God doesn't want you to have a guilty conscience before man or a guilty conscience before him. He wants you to come to a place of perfect peace with man and God. He wants you to experience Jesus in this personal, intimate way that you can know peace for the rest of your life. That in every single circumstance that comes into your life, you will have peace that passes all understanding. Do you want that? Really? Do you want to have peace? Then do what Jesus said. That's all. Ask. Because he's already reconciled it. He's already taken care of it. It's already been done. You just have to ask. You just have to come to Jesus as you are and admit what you are. 
you are a wicked worker. Yeah. You will, at some point in time, prove that you are wicked. And at some point in time, you'll prove that in your mind that you feel like you're an enemy with God. And at some point in time, somebody somewhere is going to convince you of that. Or somehow, some spiritual wickedness in high places, some principality and some power is going to influence you in that way. I've got news for you. i got good news for you. You're reconciled. Yeah, it's done. It's over with. Solved. So in order to get that in your mind, in order to appreciate that in your soul, in order to make that real in your spirit and in your heart where it counts, you have to ask. You have to ask Jesus to take the reality of the Word, put it in your heart, and make it live out its part that He can do by His Spirit, breathing life unto it as though it were the wind blowing through the very recesses of your mind, clearing out that hard drive and giving you a new programming. One that's been reconciled to God. One that has a purity of code that has no conflicts, that has no blue screens of death, that isn't going to crash, but is going to operate exactly in order, the way that God intended it to do. The way that God wants you to have your mind. The way that God wants you to be pleasing to Him. The way that God wants you to please Him is to be at peace with Him. Because He's already done the work. He's already paid the price. He's already reconciled the books. You are written in the Lamb's Book of Life and you are written in the Book of Life. You now need to go forward with peace. And that's what God can do for you. So let's pray and ask God to do that for you. Because I know if you're like me, you have those guilty times where you feel like you're a sinner and you're like Paul, the worst of sinners, the chiefest of sinners, that you just feel like you can't go on, that there's no way that you could ever be forgiven, that what you've done is too evil, too bad, too desperately disgusting, or too insanely <laughs> sinful, that no way can a holy God forgive you. Yes, He can. Because God loves you. And because God is love, He already demonstrated His love towards you. He's already proven how He can reconcile everyone at any time, in any place, in every situation to Himself. And that's through Jesus. Be reconciled to Jesus. Let's pray and ask God to do that. Father, I thank You that You've given us Your Word, that You can balance the books in Heaven, that You can see exactly who we are, that You can reconcile our sinful nature, our disgusting and despicable mind, our corrupted flesh, the very soul that we have and the spirit that we live in, you can reconcile that to yourself by your Son. And that amazes me. It causes me to really recognize so much so how much I owe you for everything that you've done. Because God, I know that I am wicked. I know that I owe you. I know that I have a guilty conscience and at times I'm an enemy to you because I want to do my own thing. I want to be my own way. I want to be led by myself. But God, I pray that you'll change that. Because if you can reconcile the books, if you can actually change the way of the world to be reconciled back to Jesus by what he's done by the blood of the cross, then by the blood of the cross, God, change me. Make me now into your image. Make me into the ideal that you want. Make me the idea of what you created me to be. Make me become Jesus. And God, since you have reconciled all things to your Son, Jesus, I pray that you will, as that priest, as that person, as our God and our Lord and Savior, that you'll take us from the place of being maybe left behind and prepare us for the time to be caught up into your will and your way. So that should you come today, we would not only be caught up in your will, we would be caught up into your place of you, the place that you have prepared for us. So Jesus, I pray that in that way, in that time and in that place, you'll make us just be perfect for what we are, as sinful as we are, as imperfect as we are, but doing the will that you want for us. Because God, you've reconciled us. And I can't help but think that somehow by that blood, Jesus, you've just covered us. You've like 
so infested our soul, our flesh, our being that it just permeated every part of us. And so God, let it be that we are now perfect in your sight so that we are pleasing the Father. And God, I just pray that since it is your Father, Jesus, that you'll just bless him with our life and bless him with your will and bless him with just the words we say today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I pray the Lord may take you from your guilt conscious, from your wicked works, from the way that you thought about yesterday to the way God wants you to think today and the will he wants for you tomorrow. Because if you'll just simply ask Jesus to make it real in your life, not only will he reveal what he wants, he'll show you himself and reveal the Father to you. God bless you. Be at peace. After all, he is the Prince of Peace.